In this video I'm going to be walking you through the process of managing a coal fire. There's nothing really complicated about it but you do need to have a good understanding of what's happening in the forge so that you can build a good hot fire and understand why some of the problems develop. And then of course once you understand how the problems occur then correcting it is a pretty straightforward matter. Unfortunately, forges aren't like campfires. You, know, you can't just throw a log on every once in a while and expect them to work for you. They need constant attention, but the work is pretty straightforward and routine, and before you know it, it'll become second nature and you won't even realize you're doing it. So this is my coal forge, and this is exactly how I left it yesterday. And the reason I'm starting here is because this is where most people have problems. They really don't know what to do with this stuff. There's pieces that are obviously coke. There are other pieces that look like chunks of gravel. There's dust. There's ashes. Uh, there's little chunks of clinker that are the size of rice. And, you know, who knows what else. They understand the raw coal that went into it and the coke that's supposed to come out of it. And, but all this other stuff is really a mystery and they just don't know what to do with it. And my initial reaction and assumption was that I needed to sort through all this stuff and get rid of all the impurities and all the slag and everything else so that I could have a nice pristine fire. And it took me quite a few years to realize that, you know, in a properly managed fire, the fire sorts all this out for you and you really don't need to worry about it. So the reality is, uh, regardless of how it looks, you really just have two materials here. You have stuff that's going to burn, and that's going to contribute to the fire. And then you have stuff that isn't going to burn, and that they're likely going to form into a clinker or an ash. And basically, uh, you pull out the clinkers, the ashes fall through the grate into the you know, ash dump, and uh, you keep going. I mean, that's the reality of forge work. It's not a pristine environment. Uh, there's a lot of crap that's naturally occurring in coal. It's going to burn through, sort out. You know, there are processes like forge welding where you do have to, you know, clean your fire and make sure that it's as pristine as possible before you start. But that's it. You know, 99% of the work that you do can really be done in a pretty crappy environment. As long as you have a good, solid fire that has reasonable coal, even dust like this is volatile and will contribute to the fire. So sorting all this out and throwing it out is wasteful and unnecessary and spending a lot of time you know doing that is really unnecessary because like I say the fire is going to sort it all out for you. So this is what I'm looking at when I'm starting my fire. Again I don't spend a lot of time cleaning stuff out. I'll pick out the big lumps of you know, clinker, I mean, and things like that that are obvious, but, you know, I don't spend more than 30 seconds cleaning out the fire. I dig out a depression in the corner, and that allows me to get the torch down deep in the fire so I can start building the fire underneath the mass of coals. That's very important. You can't start the fire on the top and expect it to go down when your air blast is forcing it up. So you have to get the fire down deep so that the heat works its way through the coals going upwards. I start my fire using a propane torch. It's a lot safer and I don't have any combustible materials lying around the shop. This torch has a hose going back to the propane tank. If you use a torch that has the torch tip attached to the bottle then you're going to need to tip the bottle upside down and you're not going to get a really hot flame and you're going to have trouble starting your fire with that. So I just point the flame at the base of the coals for a few minutes. I'm not supplying any air with the blower at this point. It's just the burner heating up the coals. Once I get the coals pretty hot, I'll start giving it a little bit of an air blast to see how it reacts. If the color intensifies, then I know the coals are ready and I'll start piling the fire around the coals and then just give it some more air to start the fire. So now I'm shutting off the torch and I'm starting to crank the blower to give it an air blast. You don't need a lot at first, but you do need a constant supply of air to intensify the fire. And of course, once the fire gets established, you can start giving it more air. And then uh, I also use the ladle to kind of push the fire over top of the grate because it started off in one corner. So I just kind of coax it over towards the center and then that helps it burn as well. So my students are always surprised that even though they built a fire that 
doesn't look like it was made out of anything combustible. Within a few minutes it looks exactly like it did the day before when they left it. So now we have the fire going and it's going well and there aren't any problems. Uh, so what we do next is really going to be determined by the kind of work that we're going to be doing. If all you're going to be doing is heating up metal for forging and you're not planning on doing any welding, then it's okay at this point to pile some raw coal around the edges of the fire so that it can start to burn off into coke. If your first job is going to involve some welding, then you need to establish this fire a little bit more. So you need it to burn in and allow all the impurities to collect into a clinker and you need to draw that clinker out of the fire and then build your fire for the welding that you need to do. And the reason there's a difference is because when you're forging the metal is in and out of the fire quite a bit so you have time to pull out any clinkers that might develop or work with the fire while you know before you start your next heat. But when you're taking a welding heat, you need a fire that burns very intensely for a much, much longer period of time. So you want to make sure that that fire is clean as you can get it and that there aren't any clinkers that are going to start forming in the middle of that welding heat. But this is an educational fire, so I'm going to not touch it and let it burn down so I can hopefully show you how you know, the different problems look like as they develop. Now the fire's been burning for a few minutes and I haven't touched it and it may look to you like it's doing very well but in a second you're going to see a dark line develop right in the center of the intense part of the fire. So that dark line indicates that the bottom of the fire has just dropped out and it's actually burning hollow right now. And I can confirm this by shoving the poker in the center of that spot and there's absolutely no coals there whatsoever. Now it may seem that poking the fire has corrected the problem, but all it's done is tumble some hot coals into that cavity and you know, as soon as they burn out, uh, the problem is going to return. What we need to do to correct this is to push that cavity out of the base of the fire. So I use my poker and I'm shoving the sides of the fire down towards the tweer. This is going to compress the fire back into a solid mass that I need to continue forging. Instead of using a poker, sometimes blacksmiths will use a pair of tongs to hammer the sides of the coal bed back down towards the center of the fire. That's one of the reasons a commercially made fire pot is the way that it is. The sloping sides just naturally push everything towards the center when you apply pressure at the top. Just using a rake to rake coals over the top of the fire isn't going to solve this problem. You need to compress the fire and get rid of that air gap. So now we're moving on to the second problem that you're going to have with your fire and the confusing part is it looks the same as the first one. But this isn't a hollow fire, it's a clinker. And that dark spot that developed in the center of the fire is because you have a solid mass in there that isn't burning and it's actually being cooled by the air blast. So how do you tell the difference? Well, again, you use your poker and this time when you see what's going on with that dark spot, it's going to meet up with some resistance. So, you know, it's not just going to drop into the fire and, you know, reveal a cavity that's burned out of the bottom of the fire, it's actually going to be a lump and you're going to bump up against something. So at that point you know it's a clinker and it has to come out of the fire. Now clinkers are just a part of the process, it's something you have to deal with on a daily basis. It doesn't matter what kind of coal you're using, sooner or later the impurities are going to burn into a mass and develop a clinker. Especially if you're forge welding because you're adding that much more flux which draws even more impurities out of the uh, coal and you get clinkers even faster. So one thing you're going to get good at is figuring out how to get clinkers out very quickly and restoring your fire and getting back to work. So this isn't a problem that you have to worry about. And this is a process where you need to learn that you know you don't have to get everything out of that fire. Just go after that main mass, get it out of there, any little bits that might fall off to the side. If you can rake them out quickly that's fine. If not, don't worry about them. You'll get them next time. 
the main thing you have to realize here is that your coals are getting cooler because they're not getting an air blast and they're being pulled apart so there's you know they're cooling that much quicker plus your metal is cooling if you're in the middle of the heat so pull apart your fire get that mass out there you know put everything back together get back to work you know again the fire will sort everything out when you're adding raw coal to the fire, always lay it on the sides of the fire. Don't put it on top. That just creates a lot of smoke for nothing. And it, there is no advantage to putting it on top. You don't really need a lot of heat to start driving off the impurities from the coal and to start the process of converting it into coke. So laying it on the sides allows it to cook a little bit until you need it. And again, you're always pushing the fire from the outside in. So that coal has lots of time to turn into coke before it reaches the center of the fire. Now if you've just added a bunch of raw coal to your fire and you realize you have a clinker and you need to pull that fire apart, well then, you know, that isn't a problem. Just scrape the raw coal as much as you can off to the sides and then scrape the live coals in the opposite direction so that you can get at your clinker and then rake everything back. If some of the raw coal gets into the center, don't worry about it. Again, the fire is going to sort it all out. It isn't a big problem. You just don't want a lot of raw coal in the center of the fire, but you know, one third, two thirds, like who cares? It isn't going to affect the fire. It's going to coke up very quickly and drive that heat into the metal. So, you know, these are all things you don't need to get crazy about. So here I just want to go over the poker technique that I was trying to show you earlier, but the flames were messing up the exposure on my camera. Um, when I build a poker, I usually make sure that it's no longer than the narrowest side of the fire pot that I'm using. So that allows me to use it on any side of the fire pot without getting hung up. The other thing you need to realize too that is your sides of your fire pot taper towards the center then you need to make it that much shorter so it doesn't hang up as you're driving it into the fire. And the ladle also works well for this. The other thing I do with the poker that I didn't show you earlier is that I'll drive it into these corners of the fire pot and I'll twist it to the side slightly and depending on how the fire reacts to that twisting motion, I'll be able to establish fairly soon whether there's a clinker forming. In a clean fire, the poker is going to react the same way that it would if you stuck it into a pail of gravel and twisted it slightly. There'd be a mass uh, that's slightly larger than the poker that would be disturbed, but the whole fire wouldn't move. If you have a clinker, when you drive the poker underneath that clinker and start to twist it, the whole fire is going to start to move. So you know you have a mass developing there. Don't be concerned about a little bit of movement that might happen on the top surface. That may just be the raw coal turning into coke. Here I have a clump that's developed from raw coal turning into coke. Some of the impurities that burn out of the raw coal turn into a real tarry substance and it tends to stick a lot of bits of coal together. When you have a clinker, you'll see a large mass right in the center of the fire moving as one solid lump. That won't happen once the fire has turned into coke. It'll start reacting like gravel. You know, uh, it'll stay separate, it won't clump together like this. So in the next couple of minutes, I just want to go over all this again so that you have a really clear understanding of what's going on in the fire because it's really important to understand this. And um, I'm going to do it in a diagram format because this is just something that is impossible to film. So I just want to really make sure that you get the, uh, the right idea about what's going on in the fire. So here I have a cross section of the fire and this oval shaded area represents the hot intense part of the fire. And the arrow represents the air supply. If you leave this fire alone and don't do anything to it, just keep supplying air to it, you're going to start burning away the coals that are right above the air supply. 
this is going to cause the base of the fire to start moving up towards the top. You're not going to get more coals just naturally falling down to fill that cavity. So if you continue using this fire without correcting it, you're going to get to a point where that hollow spot is going to rise high enough that you're going to start seeing it as dark spots in your fire. And that's what I showed you earlier. And that dark spot was actually a hole that was developing in this ceiling. I just concentrated on one, but there were actually several that were forming at the same time. So here's what was happening when I was driving the poker in the center of that fire. There's no coal there, so I was meeting no resistance. So to correct the problem, you take the poker and you drive it in the sides so that you can compress the fire back into a nice compact form. You do it from all sides and that pushes fresh coals into that cavity. And then once you push the cavity back in on itself, everything starts to work normally because you have hot coals and then you have air feeding that fire. And so you start to develop that nice glowing mass that you need in the center of the fire to get a good heat. A clinker, on the other hand, develops as a result of that hot mass of coals that you have in the center and it's impurities that start dripping down towards the air supply and the air supply cool off that slag and it turns it into a clinker. You still lose your fire but this time it's because the bottom of your fire pot is starting to fill up with all the impurities that are turned into a clinker. The last thing I want to cover today is how to approach a forge that doesn't have a conventional fire pot. Everything that I've explained here still goes, but the trick to using these forges is to fill the entire area with coal. So by doing that, the coal actually becomes the side walls of the fire pot. So you may need to weld some flanges to the base to contain the coals or develop some kind of an arrangement like that, but you can't just work on a flat plate and heap coals in a mound. To do any serious forging, as I've mentioned in other videos, you need to have a good depth of coal and you, for that you need some way of containing that coal. It either has to be in a fire pot or in an arrangement like this. You know, you can't just work on a flat plate. It doesn't really allow you to build the fire the way you need to build it. So I hope this helps you out and as always if you have any questions just leave a comment and I'll get back to you and help any way that I can. Hi, I'm Dennis and thanks for watching. If you like this video by all means give it a thumbs up. If you want to support this channel you have a couple of options to do that. The first of course is to just subscribe. Secondly, if you have any suggestions or photographs of things you'd like to see on this channel, send them along and I'll do my best to turn them into a video. If you want to lend your financial support, you can do that in a couple of ways. First, if you're interested in making an ongoing contribution to this channel, just click the Patreon icon and it'll take you to my Patreon page and you can donate whatever amount you feel comfortable with. If you want to make a one-time contribution, just go to my channel homepage and click the donate button in the banner. So thank you for your support, and with your help, I'll be doing this for some time to come. I'll see you next time.